Continuing on our conversation this morning, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, green energy, uh, yesterday at Invest Malaysia 2021, uh, the uh, Prime Minister, um, come uh, Finance Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim discussed at length about how uh, the country is going to present some sort of a seed fund towards uh, creating a carbon capture exchange. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be unpacked here. Uh, let's start off with our conversation with uh, Dato Dr. Rais Hussein, the CEO and President of M Research, joining us live uh, online. Um, Dr. Rais, maybe you can share with us um, the landscape of how things are and how things look like when it comes to uh, carbon capture exchange. In fact, carbon capture per se, uh, Rais. Uh, as you all know, uh, carbon credit these days is a buzzword among, uh, I mean, globally. Uh, it's a huge market. Uh, first of all, let's establish why do they actually need a carbon credit. Uh, we all know that uh, we are all trying to mitigate the climate change issues uh, by reducing the greenhouse uh, gas emission, which is normally uh, called GHG. Uh, however, uh, many businesses find it very difficult uh, and they cannot, uh, although are trying so much to reduce the emission. Um, because of this uh, challenging uh, uh, moments and challenging times, especially with climate control and so on. Uh, it is uh, obvious and apparent that uh, the net zero uh, emission objectives are met. Now we see uh, some of the shareholders and some of the even investors have made it a mandate, uh, a mandate for them, for the companies uh, to achieve a certain desired level of uh, net zero emissions before they invest. So obviously there are two types of uh, carbon credit, the voluntary one, uh, or what we call the voluntary carbon credit, or also the mandated one. So what we are talking about today is uh, voluntary one. Eh? Now, if you look at, uh, in the Malaysian context, uh, if you look at the size of the market global credit, uh, uh, carbon credit worldwide, uh, it is upwards towards 50 billion, uh, reaching uh, by 2030. So it's a massive, massive, uh, Massive was established in uh, 2011 uh, to facilitate the trading of carbon credit. Uh, I think uh, it's not quite known, but uh, it's called Malaysian National Carbon Credit Registry. However, uh, this is done on a voluntary basis, uh, comes under the purview of uh, Ministry of Energy, Science, Technology, Environment, and Climate Change. Now, however, the the progress uh, is not been uh, that good. Uh, we only registered about uh, 1.5 million carbon credit, uh, resulting in a reduction of about 1.2 million tons. It's a very, very modest number, but it's a, it's a start. So yesterday's announcement by the Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim in the context of facilitating uh, the new uh, ecosystem and enabling uh, the ecosystem for carbon credit is a welcome a relief and reprieve for the uh, industry. Uh, Malaysia uh, can be and uh, must be uh, someone who can spare this carbon credit. Uh, let's let's go back to that whole conversation of uh, what was announced uh, yesterday, um, because uh, this is uh, uh, not. I guess not something new, but a further elaboration on what has been presented in the budget. Uh, the government is committing to a seed fund amounting to about 10 million ringgit to act as an assured demand of Malaysian generated carbon credits to kickstart the market to support the national journey to achieve that net zero emissions as early as 2050. Um, Datuk Sri Anwar said that there is a need for, an, for us to enhance our investments in green growth areas, including hydrogen tech bioenergy, electric mobility. These are the enablers of green adoption across sectors as well as future economic engines. Uh, and because of this, do you see how far are we from achieving these uh, net zero emission targets by 2050? In fact, what will be the kind of challenges that is stopping us from achieving these uh, uh, targets right now? I think it is a, it's a good start uh, that uh, all this has been thought about and, uh, and, and clearly uh, the direction has been set. I think that that is the go good start. Uh, however, there are many more efforts that needed to be done uh, in educating uh, the public, the organization, the company, uh, what carbon credit entails. Sometimes uh, they loosely translate carbon credit as carbon uh, a, a replacement. I think that is uh, incorrect. So we need to be very mindful 
Now, coming to uh, one of the most important infrastructure in the carbon credit uh, uh, in any nation and any uh, country is setting up of the uh, or digitizing the carbon credit uh, accounting. You see, the, prob the, the important part of it, it will improve efficiency, transparency, and accessibility. But we do have challenges like, for instance, uh, even the re reliability of the data, reliability of uh, whether actually uh, the carbon credit has happened, uh, who is valuing it, how it is being valued, uh, what about the cost levels, what about the pricing level. There's a mismatch between uh, the pricing of these carbon credits uh, as well as uh, uh, the actual uh, cost that uh, entails. Then again, there are some challenges with regards to uh, the lag time between when it was priced and when it's taken up. Uh, so there are many, many challenges and issues are there, but I think uh, uh, we, we, we need to look at a series of uh, digitizing the entire infrastructure. So uh, or I'm talking about uh, the registry itself and without uh, digitizing it uh, and based on blockchain, uh, there could always be some confidence level vis-a-vis -vis ascribed to the carbon credit exchange. Okay. Uh, do we need that kind of infra support uh, that needs to support this energy transition to have good uh, hydrogen technology, to have strong bioenergy growth and development and perhaps be a, a central feature in electric mobility, for instance? Um, in fact, a, a rather blunt question, is 10 million ringgit enough uh, for the seed fund to generate this kind of catalytic growth for energy transition? just a yes. start to uh, boost this particular sector. But uh, obviously, 10 million ringgit is a modest amount. Uh, but it's a, it's a good start. And people are still un trying to understand uh, how the whole mechanism uh, works. I, I think, uh, I, again, I said, if we do not digitize the carbon credit uh, accounting, uh, and pr uh, then we will have a big challenge. Uh, who is going... I mean, we, we know that in the context of Malaysia, we have this... Uh, our bursa uh, taking the lead, but it is important the whole entire process to be digitized. And uh, what are the benefits of that uh, uh, digitizing this uh, carbon credit registry? Yeah? I'm not even talking about exchange. Uh, first of all, for increased transparency. One of the big issues and challenges that global carbon credit uh, entities are facing is that, uh, in terms of credibility, uh, there have been some investigation been. <laughs> Uh, comments uh, where carbon credit uh, registry have been questioned whether it's actually the real carbon credit. We know that, uh, remember, like for instance, a, a company or an organization is allowed uh, a certain level of uh, emission uh, uh, and anything beyond that, uh, they are taxable or they need to pay a fine or something like that to protect the, uh, the, 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 the globally. Now, they also uh, sometimes they uh, overshoot that emission, and then they must start looking for other companies who have not overshoot that. Maybe they have some surplus of carbon credit, and then they will trade. So this is where we need to have a, a, a banking grade type of uh, registry with all the relevant uh, uh, check and balance in the system uh, in terms of pricing, costing, timing, uh, is it true that a carbon credit will exist in first place? And how is it accounted for? So this, again, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very critical for any success. So I think uh, 10 million ringgit is just, uh, as you use the word catalyst, and just as a start, a catalyst. But I think uh, more will come. Okay, let's uh, bring in the graphics that we have right now uh, when it comes to uh, the kind of energy transition. If you can just uh, in the graphics right now uh, uh, um, on the screen. Uh, this uh, graphics basically shows the kind of um, energy transition uh, that we can uh, 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 exploit when it comes to global greenhouse gas emissions. As you can see, energy constitutes uh, close to three quarters of uh, the uh, global greenhouse um, uh, usage. And of course, agriculture uh, constitutes the other 20%. So all in all, energy and agriculture is going to be used quite extensively. Do you feel that this kind of energy transition uh, when it comes to global greenhouse gases needs to address, say, for instance, the energy portion first before we jump into all the other sectors uh, that is needed uh, to address this kind of uh, uh, change when it comes to energy transition? Uh, 
uh, Dr. Ais? Isn't the data looks very staggering? This is uh, data they got from 2016, but this is the current most data that they have. 72%. That's an immense figure uh, for, for their emission as a result of energy. We all know, for instance, uh, on one end, they contribute to a lot of this uh, carbon uh, emission or, or gas and all that. But on the other end, the prices of this particular thing gone up uh, two, threefold in Europe, for instance. So what does that mean? Uh, obviously, we need to look at how we address. I mean, companies like in Malaysia, for instance, Petronas uh, uh, and, and Shell and all that, who are actually uh, producing oil and, and all that, uh, they're really looking for uh, what we call uh, uh, carbon credits that they need to have. So these are the big, big markets, uh, even in-house, that has been built. So what happens? Uh, they all have their own uh, net uh, zero uh, targets, uh, not forgetting Tanaga National, for instance. So what happens when they cannot find, uh, they themselves, uh, for net credit, they have to buy uh, the net credit, uh, carbon credit in the uh, global market. What happens then? Then the money goes out of the country. So when you create a registry in Malaysia, um, uh, and, and closely and, and, and blockchain based, yeah? so that there will be no ha hacking capabilities, no uh, issues with regards to credibility, no issues to many other challenges that the carbon credit uh, registry is facing worldwide. Then what happens is that we create a, a, a centrality of market in Malaysia for carbon credit. Forget not, eh? there are also natural carbon credit that we have. We have the uh, one of the oldest uh, uh, rainforests in the world. It's not the oldest in uh, Balloon Forest, for instance. We have a large chunk and tracks of uh, forest in the Sabah. So all this can be encashed. Uh, French Guiana president, for instance, have said very clearly that one of the revenues, apart from the recent uh, discovery of the oil and every, oil and gas in that territory, is carbon credit. So I think... Uh, uh, a holistic approach has to be made, uh, and we need to get it right from the beginning. If we do not get it right, we do a piecemeal, uh, and then we, we try to correct here and there, it will be a problem. So I think there are ample uh, uh, good, uh, good practices uh, in this space that we can see uh, worldwide, uh, like that of in the U.S., who has been uh, uh, spearheading this, uh, in U.K., for instance, has been spearheading this. We need to take these good practices and then uh, realize here and actualize here. So it's like when you want to do something, uh, you need to uh, evaluate uh, or, or copy uh, uh, the country that has done it right. So I'll just give you an, another example. We all know single wholesale network for 5G is a proven failure worldwide. So why do we want to copy that in Malaysia, for instance? I'm just giving an example. So... Uh, these are the things, uh, but this uh, tamilering it is just the beginning, I, I think, for the startup system, ecosystem in this space. But I'm sure eventually there will be more to come. Okay, uh, if we can just, um, in the uh, detail of the graphics uh, right now, um, taking in from my iPad, um, we look at the energy at 73%, uh, 73.2%. Um, I'm just, let me just see if I can just pull this in. So energy use in industry is a quarter right now. Uh, and of course, when we look at transportation, it's also 16%. And energy use in buildings is actually 17%. So do you feel that these are the areas that we need to focus on? Energy use in buildings, transport, and of course, industry. These should be the three key components when it comes to trying to bring about cleaner energy and better energy uh, transition? Absolutely. Because we all know that uh, the amount of emission as a result of transportation and the energy use in the industry, that means, and also the, the, the third part as well, it, it, it's, it's massive. And we cannot continue uh, uh, not tracking and observing this. Again, uh, we must start at a, at a good footing. We cannot uh, simply... Uh, Cut and paste things that is uh, uh, that we will need a lot of tweaking in the in the future. So the way to go, I, I keep I'm repeating this many many times. The way to go is to digitize the entire uh, carbon credit register and then also the exchange, uh, blockchain based, so that there will be no hacking possibilities, 
and gives a lot of credibility. In terms of energy, 72 percent, it's, it's a wow. And not, not, not many people knew that uh, this is going to be uh, this bad, and, but this, that's how it, it is. All right. Uh, we'll go for one short break. When we come back, we'll discuss a bit more with Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rais Hussein. Uh, thanks for continuing on with us. Uh, we are with Datuk Dr. Rais Hussein, who's joining us live uh, via online. Uh, we are talking about the kind of items that is coming in from energy transition uh, conversations uh, following the Invest Malaysia Summit that was happening yesterday or that happened yesterday. Uh, we need to talk a little bit more about the Bursa Carbon Exchange, Dr. Rais. Um, it was launched in December last year, just three months ago, um, and it was presented as a vital catalyst in the acceleration towards a net zero emission target by 2050. Notably, this is the first exchange in the world to receive a Sharia pronouncement for its uh, carbon exchange program. Do you feel that the Bursa Carbon Exchange is a good step forward when it comes to carbon exchange, carbon uh, capture uh, exchange to be created? Uh, where do you see Bursa Carbon Exchange moving forward when it comes to energy transition? I think the sky is the limit. Uh, we, we all know that uh, we need a credible exchange and uh, Bursa uh, spearheading this is a, uh, is a good move. And uh, uh, now the only th other thing that is important is uh, uh, to put a blockchain-based uh, carbon exchange uh, uh, on top of it. And on top of it, they also need the uh, proper uh, blockchain-based, uh, uh, completely digitized uh, register, uh, which will uh, have all the available carbon credit in Malaysia and then uh, open for uh, to be purchased. Uh, either by local companies, uh, local organization, uh, or more importantly, uh, that is to keep them uh, keep the money within the shores, but also to bring uh, investment inside Malaysia. By like for instance, Singapore, uh, they need a uh, carbon credit, and uh, they need to go and find where to buy. So Malaysia has that both uh, the, the the one is the natural part of the need, which is with the forest and isn't that. Uh, we, we have that certain accounting for it, and that accounting has to be again transparent. And then on top of that, that other carbon credits is available. So I think this is uh, important because it will then obviously increase uh, transparency, increase efficiency of how it's being done, increase control in terms of um, putting it properly in proper uh, context, uh, bringing in new investment. We are all looking for investment. Carbon credit can be a good source of in fact investment. In fact, the French Guiana president even said that there's going to be the third largest uh, uh, incoming uh, investment or inbound in investment apart from the oil and gas and tourism and increased revenue uh, for the country in both ways. One is uh, from outside organization buying uh, carbon credit, like for instance, Japan needs a lot of carbon credit. China needs a lot of, China needs massive carbon credit and uh, imagine that we will be able to market this. But to do that, uh, the, the, the kickoff of uh, 10 million ringgit is good, but we need more. Uh, we need to urgently set up a, a fully digitalized uh, blockchain-based uh, registry to enable that. So I think, uh, uh, remember, the carbon credits comes in like uh, four types of category. Yeah? One is the avoided uh, nature loss, uh, which including uh, deforestation. Uh, nature-based uh, sequestration such as reforestation, you, you put back a name. Avoidance or reduction of emissions such as methane from landfills and technology-based removal of carbon. Remember, we talk about landfills. Uh, we just got back from Barcelona. Uh, we were told that uh, 500 billion connective, uh, connected devices or devices will be there to connect uh, 8.7 billion uh, population in 2030. Yeah? So nowadays, everything is now benchmarked against 2030. That's 59 times more. What are we going to do? So there's a huge potential, massive potential. And even when uh, uh, McKinsey came out with a figure that is going to uh, upwards 50 billion uh, global uh, carbon credit uh, market and, uh, and, and, and the multiples of 100, uh, I think it is still understated and uh, very conservative. So Malaysia must take the initiative but do it the right way. 
Uh, Dr. Raiz, I want to pick your brain on this particular topic. I did not discuss this particular topic uh, beforehand uh, in arranging this interview with you, but uh, perhaps it's, it's, it is timely. The Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change Ministry organized the Energy Transition Town Hall on the 7th of March, two days ago. The NRECC Minister, Nick Nazmi, said that the orthodoxies must be challenged to accelerate energy transition in Malaysia. And the session saw Nick Nazmi and Rafizi Ramli, the economics minister, as well as panellists from other energy industry uh, 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 experts, answering questions from stakeholders. Long story short, the policy right now is to not export renewable energy out. So while we're talking about um, uh, energy transition, maybe we can talk about renewable energy and the ability for us to export it out. Right now, the policy is to no, not export. Do you feel that this is the right way moving forward uh, when it comes to uh, exporting or non-exporting renewable energy? I think we have a short-term, medium-term, long-term strategy. So in the short term, obviously, we should not be uh, exporting uh, renewable energy because that's uh, uh, in-house or in-country uh, carbon credit that we have. Uh, I think uh, some of the big uh, tech, the four big tech companies, uh, like Amazon and I mean recently they announced they're coming to Malaysia, uh, spending some billions over a period of 14, 15 years. Now, they were also present in uh, Singapore and also some big tech companies were considering to go to Singapore. The only reason, one of the reasons that they couldn't go to Singapore is because uh, Singapore does not have sufficient level of, uh, you know, this... Uh, the renewable energy uh, type of, so that they will get a certain classification, the green classification for the their, their data centers and so on. So they then chose to go to uh, like Indonesia, they go to Malaysia and so on. Now, yes, for now, uh, maybe on a short term, um, uh, medium term, uh, we may uh, uh, go easy on exporting because we, we need that renewable energy, we need the carbon credit, we need that uh, emission uh, uh, reducing the emission capabilities using renewable energy. That's correct. But the classification is important. However, in the longer term, uh, uh, we have this Bakun Dam, for instance. Uh, Bakun Dam, uh, as you understand, is a huge uh, investment. And there are many countries that are looking at uh, buying power from them. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, a very important uh, source of energy. Uh, that can be attached for the state of Sarawak. Uh, like in the European market, you have the UK importing excess capacity from Germany uh, through some uh, uh, undersea fiber inter interconnectivity. So can we sell uh, this type of uh, energy uh, from originating from Bakun Dam, apart from serving Sabah and Sarawak, uh, Kalimantan, can we sell it to others? I think the question and the answer is very simple. We should, uh, but this is in the long term because it will have added revenues, badly needed added revenues, uh, uh, income uh, for for Sarawak uh, so that they can develop even bigger. So I think there's a phased uh, strategy. Yes, in the short term, medium term, we keep this uh, renewable energy here because then uh, we can encash the carbon credit and we can also contribute and help us to us this uh, uh, net zero emission in 2050. Uh, so, yes, but in the long term, we need to consider that uh, things like Bakun Dam, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge uh, investment that we've invested. There's a huge capacity there. So why cannot we uh, export this energy to uh, countries that they need uh, from us? Okay. Uh, going back to uh, our initial topic, which is energy transition, uh, and, and the speech that was given by Adatok Sri Anwar at Invest Malaysia, he mentioned that other forms of support in this area come in the form of a green technology financing scheme, investment tax allowance, and income tax exemption for eligible activities. Um, Anwar added that uh, well, while we talk about a viable future for the environment where respect for the planet and quality of life are the driving principles, it is a natural fit for further development and support through Islamic finance a field where Malaysia has been long recognised as a global leader. He argues that the government is committed in enhancing the Islamic finance ecosystem even further so that it can drive real societal change, especially through optimization of wakaf. 
Do, uh, uh, in this regard, he argues that the Securities Commission, with effective from 3rd of April this year, just one month to go, will extend the Waqaf featured fund framework to include the Islamic Real Estate Investment Trust and Islamic Exchange Traded Funds. So do you feel that these kind of facilities and uh, 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 financing capabilities as uh, managed by SC, for instance, can help facilitate the driving force on energy transition and carbon capture and just generally building a better uh, framework for us to achieve net zero emissions by 2050? And more importantly, where do you see Islamic finance sit in the value chain of us creating a better future when it comes to energy transition? I think Islamic finance is another word for conventional finance. I think it is basically almost no different apart from lexicon. But the most important aspect of what was captured by Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim in this context is Wakaf. I think uh, Wakaf is an important uh, uh, element in, the, in, in, in cat catalyzing and pushing and moving uh, the economy as a whole. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is that Wakaf in Malaysia, for instance, has been quite in the slumberland for many, many years. I think it's time to energize uh, Wakaf. If you look at Turkey, for instance, yeah. Wakaf is a very uh, uh, important uh, element and factor in India economy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about real Wakaf. They run universities. They run uh, so there are two types of Wakaf. There's a cash and a non-cash uh, Wakaf. So coming back to Malaysia, I think uh, Wakaf is definitely the way to go. But I don't see much difference between uh, uh, Islamic finance and conventional finance uh, as, as it were. Uh, apart from the lexicon and maybe layers of contract uh, that Islamic finance has. But that's being uh, truthful. And uh, having said that, uh, yes, this is a product innovation and uh, we have uh, been a global leader in many uh, uh, the Islamic finance front like Sukuk and, and the issues of Sukuk. We, we are one of the largest uh, issue of Sukuk in the world. So having said that, yes, whatever works. But the most important thing, I, I, I've emphasized this uh, quite a bit this time around, is that the digitization of the registry and the digitization of the exchange about blockchain based. Because we need to give a, a bank grade type of infrastructure. Uh, when I say bank grade, basically when you do your ATM transaction, you do your banking transaction, the, the back uh, office is very, very uh, bank uh, grade very rigorous, very robust, very redundant, very resilient. And that is the type of infrastructure you need to uh, provide to be successful in carbon credit, uh, i.e. carbon credit registry and carbon credit exchange. And you can extend this by uh, uh, having carbon credit, Malaysian carbon credit to be uh, exchangeable and be bought by in, in the region. Let's for once uh, be uh, ahead of uh, you know, the country down south. So let's be ahead of it. The, they, for unique reason, they may not be able to do what uh, they plan to do. They do have exchange, but they may not be able to come up with a good registry because their land space and everything is quite small. In the context of Malaysia, let's for once move on. Let's be clever. All right. Uh, another key part of emphasis uh, is to ensure that Malaysians also gain uh, from transfer of high tech knowledge and skills prioritizing research and development. Uh, we're looking at areas of developing further on TVET or the technical and vocational training uh, that is being redesigned for greater participation in private sectors or from private sectors. And of course, we're looking at collaborations with uh, conventional academia and uh, perhaps some form of updates towards university syllabi across the board. Uh, do you feel that TVET is actually quite critical uh, in terms of us trying to build that kind of uh, workforce that is a little bit more um, attuned to the requirements that is needed when it comes to carbon capture, exchange and, uh, and energy transition? It is not quite critical. It is very critical, uh, Ibrahim, because without a proper talent that uh, is required, I think uh, we all know Malaysia has been suffering from brain drain for a very long time. Uh, I think the, we've lost uh, quite a, a hefty number. It does statistically anything between 500,000 to uh, 1.2 million have left our shores uh, to, to go elsewhere. 
and we can't blame them because uh, they, they they want certain things that they that there's a pull and push factor right that i always uh, describe but let's not go into detail on the brain drain but yes tvet is very critical for the success of this uh, and uh, universities must uh, start learning to see what is relevant what cannot be like a factory mill producing uh, uh, same old same old using the old uh, syllabus and old stuff so you were spot on and also uh, Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim was spot on when he talked about uh, the recalibration of uh, the syllabus to reflect the current reality, the cloud reality. Now, I mean, some time ago, we all uh, will read laboriously in the library, uh, take notes, and then uh, we start uh, money, uh, writing uh, term papers and assignments. After some time, we start just Googling. Now we have chat GPT, which is AI empowered which can do everything that you ask for. So things have changed. So I think the curriculum has to be revisited, uh, reviewed, and recalibrated uh, to reflect the current reality. TVET is a very important thing. Do not have like eight years, 10 years, uh, you know, people get, uh, by the time that you, after the end of the first year or second year, the syllabus is again, you need to be reviewed because technology changed very fast. So I think uh, we, we need to also look at how we can shorten the length of uh, studying and and bringing in the right skill knowledge and abilities and, and also the uh, the right curriculum to create the right talent pool so that we can partake in this uh, carbon credit uh, uh, it's a big thing huh? it's a huge it's a multi-billion uh, dollars as i said uh, uh, some have actually for, uh, for come up with a figure of in excess of 753 billion but uh, mckinsey says 50 billions upwards and that's uh, 2030 to 2050 where everybody wants that zero emission. So it's a huge market and we are well positioned. Uh, at least we can start, but start in the right mode uh, and, and replica and, and copy uh, the right model. Uh, do not do what we did with the 5G rollout, which is until today not done. Okay, um, that's enough on the uh, topic of energy uh, 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 conversation. I still want to maybe spend two or three minutes to talk about the, nas uh, the national brain drain that you alluded to earlier. This is because the Human Resources Ministry is drafting measures to tackle the brain drain phenomenon, uh, which is at 5.5% of our population. And this is much higher than the global average of 3.3%, uh, says the HR Minister, Minister uh, Siva Kumar. Um, he argues that a total of 1.86 million Malaysians live abroad, and out of that, 1.13 million stay in Singapore. So imagine that, 1.8 million outside of which 1.13 1, is in Singapore. Uh, this is uh, comments coming in from Talent Corp Dialogue that happened on Tuesday, 7th of March. And according to the uh, United Nations Department of Economics and Social Affairs in 2020, the main destinations for the Malaysian diaspora are Singapore, Bangladesh, Australia, the UK, the US and Brunei. And it was part of that long-term task to attract Malaysians back to the country. Do you feel that because of this brain drain that is happening, we all know wages is a big problem in Malaysia, but new sectors to talk about, like energy transition, for instance, or carbon capture, could be a way in for us to attract back our talent that is coming in from outside? Uh, we have to look at the push and pull factor. I think uh, not many studies have been made uh, in this area, uh, except uh, reporting statistics. I think the Talent Corp, uh, we all know the number that they brought back uh, is uh, epistemically low uh, relative to those who have left. Uh, we did, uh, did a research, uh, a little bit uh, more of a qualitative research, and we found that more than 500,000 have left our shows. And these are the productive one, uh, uh, professional, competent, age between 25 uh, upwards. And this has lost, this has resulted in loss of human capital that is so badly needed to energize uh, the country, the economy. So I think uh, there's a whole lot of a, a subject that really require an in-depth uh, look and deep diving, especially uh, this is going to be the important uh, engine because without human capital, you can have the best of the infrastructure, but nothing is going to work. And so I think uh, 
uh, it's, a, it's a very important thing that the government should look at, or at least Anwar Ibrahim administration should look at, uh, even review and revisit uh, what is Talent Corp really doing. Uh, I think we can't blame them too much also because, again, eh, there's a push factor, pull factor, social, economic, uh, you know, a lot of other things that comes in a way. Uh, many people think it is just the gaji, eh, the salary and wages. It's not necessarily true. So there's a wholesome package that uh, they get, like for instance, uh, some goes to, a lot of them goes to Singapore. Uh, there's one guy who went to New Zealand, for instance, and he recreated uh, my apps, the, the what my, my Sajatra apps uh, for free. And today this guy has become a, a, a Kiwi and he's been given a house, this, that, and he's pretty much settled there. And we lost a huge uh, human capital because this guy is really good. Yeah. This uh, uh, app was copied everywhere. So likewise, we have a very good heart surgeons in Australia. The best heart surgeons has gone to UK. So, and then we don't forget the doctors also are leaving. So this is a serious problem and uh, warrants a very serious discussion uh, amongst all the stakeholders. Uh, yes, the human resource ministry and so on. Yeah. So the, pr the problem is that, uh, Ibrahim, uh, is that when we talk about these issues, we are not uh, policy shaping issues. We are just talking that as like a cut and paste cosmetic without the, uh, without the uh, importance of input, output, outcome, impact model, where we spend money, but we do not look at the outcome and impact. We just uh, input, output, All right. sp uh, speed to spend. Thank you very much, Dato' Dr. Rais Hussein, the CEO and President of MA Research, for that delightful conversation.